This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser is off this week. We're coming off of hotter than hoped CPI and PPI readings, while August retail sales also surprised to the upside. And on Capitol Hill, a slew of tech titans, including Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, met with lawmakers to discuss the potential risks of artificial intelligence technology. Tech will be a big theme on this program, as we'll be talking everything from cybersecurity, space exploration, AI in the retail space, and crypto. We begin with the latter in this week's Bloomberg Business Week cover story about the mom and dad behind the man accused of one of the biggest crypto-related frauds ever, Bloomberg Business Week columnist Max Chafkin and Bloomberg News Digital Currencies reporter Hannah Miller joined me and Simone Foxman to explain how Sam Bakeman frieds elite parents helped make the rise of FTX possible. Also with us is Bloomberg Business Week editor Joel Weber. We're a couple weeks away from SBF's trial beginning October 2nd. Uh, I think that um, Joe Bankman and Barbara Freed will have some some revelations about them will will come out at that trial. I think that they are have been an underappreciated element of the SBF story. Max, why is that? Well, I think I mean one thing is that you know this is a massive alleged fraud. You know, if prosecutors are right, it's one of the biggest frauds in U.S. history. And I think you know in some sense properly we're we're focusing on Sam Bankman Freed and his inner circle. Um, the thing about the parents that is so interesting is, um, Tim, as you said, they are these um, really towering figures in academia. They're sort of famous for being like ethical, and uh, they both teach at Stanford Law School. Um, they're, they're, it's almost like the uh, least likely parents of an alleged uh, crook, and that's kind of what makes them so interesting. The second thing that makes them really interesting, and, and the reason uh, I think you play that clip, is because they were more involved in this company than they have said, that than, than Sam Bankman Fried has said, and you actually heard Joe Bankman's voice in that ad. Mm. Yeah, so, hold on. I thought that was Larry David. <laughs> yeah, it was Larry David, but Hannah, t- walk us through what else happened in there. All right, I, I could not believe that Joe Bankman had been in that commercial right under our noses. Um, we know that uh, Sam Bankman Fried's brother Gabriel requested a role for Joe in the commercial. Uh, I think it was kind of fitting that he played a founding father when he is the father of <laughs> an FTX co founder. Um, and yeah, he had that single line, <laughs> but uh, it was an effective one. So it, it just shows you, you know, that this was a family affair. Well, Take me through, Max, the details here. How exactly were they tied to this business in a true business way? Because part of the story really focuses on how they were sort of this intangible help to SBF. And then there are some actual clear ties. Yeah. And and I think those, first of all, I think the intangibles matter here. And when you go back and kind of look at one of the big, you know, enduring mysteries, I think, of this case is like, why did people go for this? You know, there were so many red flags. This is a guy who refused to wear pants. Uh, you know, he was he was low, he was running this massive financial services company. You know, in in a place that is kind of considered a tax haven. Um, a lot of his business was not allowed. And and you know, one of the things that people would point to, including investors, including you know, in one case, a for as we report in the story, a former. Um, Securities and Exchange Commissioner uh, would point to the parents. These were people with a big reputation. Now, the other thing that happened is that FTX and Alameda, which was like the precursor to FTX, it was Sam Bankman-Fried's hedge fund, um, they were, both those companies were really operating kind of on the edges of what was legal, right? The, the crypto was is a novel field. Um, they're walking, working across different countries. And Sam Bankman-Fried needed lawyers. And his dad, you know, is a pretty good lawyer, uh, or at least, you know, was seen that way at the time. And his dad, you know, from the very beginning, as we report in this story, was involved. And and what has been previously said is that, oh, well, he was, you know, maybe helped a little bit, and he mostly worked on philanthropy. But no, as, as we talk about, you know, he, he was involved in the issuing of FTT, which was kind of like the, uh, you know, funny money that Sam Bankman fried uh, created to raise money for FTX, the creation of FTX, um, this ad 
had, and you know, it's basically numerous other areas of the business. People, you know, we spoke to, you know, knew him. They they saw him in the office, um, and so you know, he was he was part of the team uh, formally starting, at, you know, at the beginning of 2022. But but going back to the to the very very beginning, Hannah, can you? Uh, enlighten us about another key element of the reporting, which is the, the the importance that the parents represented in terms of just their reputations vetting basically Sam's idea for the business, right? Sequoia Capital played a huge part in that too. Yeah, we know, you know, that they were known figures of a, both in the Stanford community and outside of it. Um, you know, I live in the Bay Area. I came across many people who, who knew of them and interviewed them for this story. And they had influence. You know, they gave their stamp of approval, um, of, you know, to uh, their family friend who then went to Sequoia and, you know, gave the recommendation um, that, you know, this was a company that they should be looking at. Um, that he knew uh, Sam Bakeman Fried's parents, that these were people uh, who were well respected, well known. Um, so, yeah, they, you know, they kind of helped pave the way for their son. There's also the political element. Uh, you know, a big part of Sam Bankman Fried's, both his kind of like actual business strategy. And, and when you look at like what's the mythology around him was was as a political player he was uh, donating huge sums of money to um, uh, especially the Democratic Party but as we've learned uh, throughout the case to, to both parties um, officially uh, he was trying to like yeah, for these uh, like effective altruism related causes mostly around pandemics but of course I think all along there was a bit of a wink wink hey and it would be pretty nice if there were some good crypto policy hmm. too now his mother Barbara Freed in addition to being this you know, famous ethicist. She's, I mean, she's a really impressive person. She's written kind of like a seminal paper on the trolley problem, which is the, if you've watched the, the, uh, the good place, it's kind of like a famous ethical quandary. She in 2016 became this major figure on the left as a kind of, uh, b- Democratic Party fundraiser, uh, funneling money from like Eric Schmidt and these big time Silicon Valley folks. That gives, of course, gives the family a bunch of connections. It also allows Sam Bankman Freed to kind of slot right in, right? He starts donating money um, in, 2000, in, in 2020 and almost immediately is like on the inner circle of Democratic Party fundraising. Um, and, it, and it's in part by giving through this um, network, Joe Bankman also had and has, you know, real connections. He's he's worked, uh, he's advised uh, political figures on tax policy. So he's, he's done a lot of um, advocacy for tax reform. And so he knew people, you know, they, they were both um, Barbara's networks and then and then Joe's contacts, uh, I think were, were helpful on both fronts and allowed Sam Bankman Fried to, you know, out of almost nowhere to be, you know, really, really on the inner circle in, in Washington, D.C., where all of a sudden you have like major uh, political figures taking seriously the idea that like this, again, guy who refuses to wear pants and is, you know, <laughs> based in some kind of jurisdiction that no one really knows for sure, no one knows what he does, that he is going to be like the guru to tell us how to, uh, you know, reform digital currencies. A guy who said, we should note, who uh, didn't want a yacht, though, as the reporting shows from Max and Hannah, um, FTX and people associated with FTX did end up buying some sort of yacht. Hannah, to that point, uh, talk to us a little bit about how Sam Bigman frieds parents benefited financially from their relationship uh, with FTX and with their son. What did you guys uncover? Well, we know that they frequently visited uh, the FTX campus in the Bahamas, that they sometimes even flew, fr- flew private to get there. Uh, they would frequently stay at a $16 million beachside apartment that FTX had purchased. They considered it to be the company's property, not their home. Um, but they also you know, really helped him uh, gain footing. Um, They, you know, as Max mentioned, you know, Joe would go with him to meet with uh, elected officials. Um, You know, they got a taste of of the nice life uh, with their son. And um, it's, uh, it was very interesting to report about their presence at FTX. Yeah, that house, by the way, I mean, it's so so they're what they say, and we should we should say this is, you know, they did not see it as theirs. They thought it was, you know, company property. Essentially, there were a lot of wonderful perks to working for FTX, you know, like uh, their people were flying private and they were, in fact, flying their Amazon packages private. Uh, But Bloomberg uh, uncovered a bill of sale 
that has their names on it. So mm-hmm. so legally, you know, mm-hmm. they own the home. Right. And and the other thing is they received quite a bit of money in in early 2022. Sam Bankman Fried gave his father ten million dollars, and the way he did that, as we report in the piece, is he uh, borrowed money from Alameda. Those are accounts that, according to prosecutors, contain customer funds. Transferred it to himself. Transferred the money to Joe. According to court documents, he asked Joe for advice on this. Asked his dad for advice, and then sent this ten million dollar check. And court documents have alleged that they're using that money, you know, to pay for the defense. Because of course, a massive criminal defense. Um, is not cheap. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Max Chafkin and Hannah Miller for breaking down the cover story with me and Simone Foxman. For the entire conversation, head on over to our Business Week podcast feed and read the article in the magazine as well. It's on newsstands now, online and on the Bloomberg terminal. Joel Weber will be back with us a bit later. Coming up, we talk to a man who spent the past two years investigating SBF, along with many other players and pawns in the crypto universe. Bloomberg Investigations reporter Zeke Fox explains the ultimate financial bubble and the gut-wrenching scams it's helped to foster across the globe. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. In 2021, crypto went mainstream with celebrity endorsements from the likes of Tom Brady to Matt Damon. Investment funds were buying it, TV ads hailed it as the future of money, and retail traders were making a fortune from Dogecoin, which was originally created as a joke back in 2013. A new book from Bloomberg News financial investigations reporter Zeke Fox tries to help us decide whether there's anything behind these unusual alternative assets or if it's all just a confidence game of epic proportions. Zeke's book is called Number Go Up, Inside Crypto's Wild Rise and Staggering Fall. He joined me and Bloomberg News Deputy Team Leader for U.S. Equities, Jess Menton, in our New York studios to explain his motivation for taking a two-year journey around the globe, chasing both true believers and outright fraudsters. Ever since I was like a kid, I wanted to write like a crazy nonfiction story. Like I loved like John Krakauer's Into Thin Air or Ben Mesrich's uh, Bringing Down the House about the MIT Blackjack Kids. But I never found a story crazy enough to turn into a whole book because the last thing I want to do is bore anyone. <laughs> and right. uh, I got once I, I was kind of resistant to crypto. But as once I jumped in, I started meeting all these like wild billionaires and hustlers and con men and scammers. And like at some point, maybe when I found myself on one crazy crypto billionaire's yacht off the Bahamas, I was like, wait, this is the adventure. Like you're on it right now. This is what you got to write about. And I ended up spending two years going down this rabbit hole. Yeah, I, I don't know that the world will ever see a financial mania like this like ever again. And we're still in the midst of it, too. I mean, we see big moves in crypto, not like we saw a couple of years ago, Zeke, but you know, we're not we're not done talking about crypto at this point. There's um, a lot that that sticks out to me from from the book, but there's this one quote that I want to read uh, to our audience. From the beginning, I had thought that crypto was pretty dumb. And it turned out to be even dumber than I imagined. So even after spending years working on this book, talking to crypto billionaires, diving into these cryptocurrencies, you still think crypto's dumb? I think that if you, anyone who's lived through like these last couple of years, um, I don't think we can just like memory hold that. Like all, I went to the, one of the first places I went was Bitcoin 2021, this big conference in Miami right after uh, COVID restrictions That's the one where everybody got COVID. Yes, not me. I, I became convinced after that that I was immune to COVID and I would never get COVID. But pretty soon after that, I did get COVID. Um, but like I'm meeting uh, some of these these guys were really legit at the time. Like I met Celsius is Alex Mashinsky. He was like talking to everybody um, and he was promising 18 percent yields uh, if you deposited your savings with with his company. And he told me when we met somebody's lying either the banks are lying that they can only pay zero percent or celsius is lying that we can safely deliver 18 percent. and like a couple of weeks ago he got arrested um just like a huge number of the founders that i met have are now facing lawsuits or bankruptcy or criminal charges um so well i do think there probably is some good cryptocurrency company out there i not going to be the one to spend the effort to sift through like another giant pile of scammers to find it. 
Something that struck me too, because you did travel to all these different hotspots from you're in Manhattan to Miami, you're in Bahamas, like you mentioned earlier, El Salvador to the Philippines. And so you were talking about how that you did see a lot of empty hype and a lot of scams. And what struck me was this new kind of investment fraud that you found where it often started with a text and it was a scam called pig butchering. Explain what that is and how that actually ended up happening to you. So. Pig butchering is when someone approaches you with a spam text. Like, we all get them. And it's like, hey, Dave, did you get the milk for the cat on your way home? <laughs> like, they don't, they're like a little off. Right. Um, but if you write back, they'll try to make friends with you. And they'll often, the person at the other end will pretend to be like an attractive young Asian woman. And they'll start dropping hints about uh, they have a rich uncle who's able to make these really profitable crypto trades. And I started, I got one of these texts and started playing along and developed a pen pal friendship with this person who was saying their name was Vicky Ho. And she eventually told me, hey, buy 100 tethers, which are like a ma mainstream stable coin you can get on Coinbase or crypto.com or any of the like normal crypto apps and send them to this other crypto app called ZBXS. And Vicky promised me that if I did that, she was gonna introduce me to profitable short-term node trades that would generate reliable 30% returns. And like, we all know this is nonsense, but in this like crypto world, like where for a couple of years, it seemed like anything was possible. A lot of people were falling for this. People sent in hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. One expert that I spoke to estimated that $10 billion had been lost to these crypto romance scams. And the crypto plays two roles in it. One is it's like, it's the story that gets people to send their money. And the other thing is that you can go on crypto exchanges, acquire these tether tokens very easily, and then zap them over and you'll never get them back. It's anonymous. The, there's no way for the authorities to trace them. This portion of the book that Jessica Jess is referring to is uh, from was was in the book, but we also were able to get you to talk to us about it a couple of weeks ago. Zeke, uh, it was featured in the uh, August twenty first issue of Bloomberg Business Week, excerpted in there. Uh, you also, uh, you know, I got to tell you, after our conversation and, and reading that excerpt, Zeke, I, I stopped. I started thinking about those spam texts in a completely different way. Uh, because it's really ugly, the the truth there. I mean, you spoke to somebody who had escaped from essentially uh, prison or, or slavery, yeah. indentured servitude, um, by, uh, by by cobbling together uh, an iPhone, uh, making an iPhone work by essentially hotwiring it. Yeah, so that is the really dark part, is that the people on the other end of these texts are often... It's not Vicky. Yeah, they're like, Vicky disappeared, never, never found out who she was. But what I did find out is that a lot of the people sending these messages... They're people from Southeast Asia who've been tricked into traveling to Cambodia and then trapped and like legitimately sounds like a conspiracy theory, but I've seen it with my own eyes, huge like office towers filled with floor after floor of people who are sending these spam text messages around the clock. Um, so that the, the person that sent you that kind of nonsense text, like it's not a bot, it could be someone who is being threatened with beatings of the torture. Um, who would have who can't leave this job without paying a ransom. Um, and like you said, yeah, well, I spoke to Twee, who was uh, victimized in this way and had raised money for the ransom from a YouTuber. And when, when I spoke to him, he returned to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And he told this crazy, yeah, MacGyverish story about how he was able to get an iPhone and charge it using no tools and a uh, fluorescent lamp. Um, and he had to smuggle the iPhone in. He st so his story was that he had stolen it from the guards, but not the charger. He had secreted it inside himself, a trick that he learned in prison, and that he, when he was alone, he took this iPhone apart and peeled out the battery and then hotwired it to a fluorescent lamp. And so very respectfully, when we were together in Vietnam, I was like, Twee, I don't think you can do that. Like, like you're, like I'm very sorry for what you went through, but like, are you sure is that really true? And he was like, "I'll show you right now." We bought an iPhone. He took it apart with no tools. Took apart a LED lamp in my hotel room. Wired the battery to this lamp, charged it, and turned it right on. I, uh, yeah, I was, I was floored. <laughs>
That was Bloomberg News financial investigations reporter Zeke Fox. Pick up a copy of his new book, Number Go Up, Inside Crypto's Wild Rise and Staggering Fall. And you can also get his thoughts on the Bored Ape Yacht Club by just heading over to our podcast feed. Jess Menton sticking with us for the rest of the program. Still ahead on Bloomberg Business Week, even if you've been able to avoid crypto-related fraud up to now, there are still some other dangers to be aware of in the digital world, especially when it comes to AI. Cyber professionals have to be right 100% of the time, and bad guys only have to be right once in order to get inside of your defenses. We'll break it down when we come back. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. The reason that I've been such an advocate for uh, AI safety in advance of sort of anything terrible happening is that I think the consequences of AI going wrong are, are severe. Um, So we have to be proactive rather than reactive. That was the voice of Elon Musk. He's been among the people calling for regulatory guidelines when it comes to artificial intelligence. And he was on Capitol Hill this past week to discuss the potential societal risks posed by the nascent technology. The world's richest man was among more than 20 tech and civil society leaders attending a closed door Senate summit on Wednesday that focused on AI. Meantime, many companies are trying to gauge its impact on cybersecurity in the workplace, especially since generative AI applications continue to evolve. Jess Menton and I have the perfect guest with us to help answer these burning questions. Dana Simberkoff, Chief Risk, Privacy and Information Security Officer at AvPoint, joining us on Zoom from New Hampshire to explain why the cybersecurity industry isn't ready for the AI boom and what guardrails companies should use to protect their employees. Dana, thanks so much for joining us. As always, I want to get your thoughts on that because when we are discussing, like Tim and myself, about this AI boom, why is it that cybersecurity companies may not be ready for this just yet? I think AI is just yet another obstacle in the road to looking for that perfect security solution that just doesn't exist out there, honestly. So um, artificial intelligence and sort of the deep learning that is coming through technologies like GBT really puts cyber professionals on edge because uh, this is just one more ripple in the world we live in where cyber professionals have to be right 100% of the time. And bad guys only have to be right once in order to get inside of your defenses. And there's no shortage of of bad guys out there, Dana, as we as we certainly know. So what's the worst case scenario here? I mean, describe for us what kind of keeps you up at night. What makes you scared? Well, I think that um, really the the secret to building a good program and, and addressing this is really to go back to cyber hygiene basics, doing what we do every day, which is making sure that we have good data governance in place within our companies and across our uh, partner ecosystems. Because if you know what information you're handling, if you know what it is, where it is, who can access it and how it's being shared, then you can largely mitigate some of the risks that are associated with AI. Um, It does come down to people, policy and technology. So there really is no bad technology, just bad use of technology. And when you're talking about cybersecurity, are there particular sub-industries or companies that you think might potentially be more vulnerable than others? Well, I certainly think that the ability for, again, those malicious bad actors to use uh, AI to potentially perpetrate cybercrime, take advantage of insiders inside of a company, um, to really... uh, accelerate the process of cyber attacks we've already seen through phishing and smishing where somebody receives a phone call or a text message saying that they are an executive that need help right away. Just imagine that amplified with the ability to actually, you know, fake a person over video, these deep fakes that we've been hearing about where the person's image or voice could be easily replicated. Uh, Dana, so, I'm. Yeah. you said phishing. We all know about phishing. Did you say smishing? Smishing, yes. That's what, smishing is using is that? uh, using a text message oh. um, or some kind of social media. So whether it's WhatsApp or your yeah. phone or, uh, you know, just pretending to be somebody that you're not and using technology to get to an intended target. And this is really common. We see it a lot, um, both inside of our company as, you know, 
um, as we build our own cyber defenses, but also across our customer ecosystem where um, it really isn't just um, what you know, but who you are uh, that makes you a target potentially within a company. Yeah, I didn't know that what it was. that's what it was called. We had a great cover story, an excerpt from uh, Zeke Fox's book, Number Go Up, that talked all about where those text messages actually come from. Uh, so I encourage everybody uh, listening who's interested to go check that one out. It was just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, okay, so Dana, what about when it comes to, I mean, when I think about the worst case scenario, I mean, I, I, I understand, like, I consider myself pretty savvy when it comes to uh, not answering those phishing emails. And we certainly get trained pretty well here at Bloomberg. And I right. think a lot of companies do that in this day and age. They send us some trick emails at times just they to do. see if we get caught. Yeah, they do. Um, you got to you got to be vigilant. I, I think my concern, though, is 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 how generative AI sort of changes that. And it makes it so it's like really not possible to distinguish what is real and, and, and what isn't real. So so. It, let's say that the weakest link is always the person. Where do companies like AvPoint come in to to try to stop that from happening? Well, I think at the end of the day, um, it really is going to come down to um, not only identity, um, but also technology and what we allow individuals to do. So um, just in the same way we've been talking over the last really couple of years with COVID about now the borderless office where employees are working really from anywhere in the world, their home, Starbucks, you know, uh, the office. Um, that means that there's no perimeter around the office that you can protect. And so identity really has become that new perimeter to a great extent. And making sure that you know who you're talking to and who you are is going to be critical. And limiting the ability for um, somebody to move either horizontally or vertically within a company if they are impersonated is going to really help sort of fill that gap and protect against that kind of risk. We actually did hear from Zscaler. They did report earnings and their forecast for EPS did beat estimates. But of course, when it comes to a cloud cybersecurity company like this, how does cloud play into this? And when it comes to AI as well and some of your concerns? Well, cloud is both an opportunity and a risk, but certainly AvPoint as a as a cloud first company providing services to, you know, millions of our customers around the world takes advantage of a lot of the built-in security controls that exist through our partners like Microsoft and others. Um, there's also a real opportunity with AI in the cloud to benefit from um, you know, the kind of machine learning and intelligence that could also be used to fight cybercrime. So I think there are tremendous opportunities that the cloud brings, but really at the end of the day, it's somebody else's computer. And so um, that good data hygiene, data governance is going to be critical to making sure that whether you're in the cloud or on-premise, that you're really doing the right things to protect your business and your data. Is there a future for on-premise or is it all in the cloud? Well, hard to say. I think, you know, the cloud is certainly the, the future. Um, it's, it's the wave. It's the direction that we see companies moving more and more. Um, I think that there will likely always be some hybrid environments. And depending on your industry, depending on the kind of information you have, um, cloud is not always possible, but we'll see. Now, you never say never. And I think it's always good to hedge your bets. Whenever you speak to companies, what is their biggest concern right now? Well, again, I think it is knowing where that data is. It's that unknown, that risk of um, not knowing is never better. And so, you know, the challenge for AI is clearly that you can have a machine outpacing you rapidly. We now see that our computers regularly are asking us to prove that we're human by answering things like CAPTCHAs when you go to websites. Um, will computers outpace humans? At some point, maybe. I think, again, for cybersecurity and privacy professionals, it's building accountability into the way that we use data, making sure that there's good transparency with our customers and making sure that we're really you know, doing the right thing to maximize the opportunity for businesses uh, to do what they should be doing while protecting the rights of individuals and data subjects. I don't know, Jess, do you have any, ever have a problem with those uh, CAPTCHAs? I feel like there are, they've already... The, the captures have already outsmarted me. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? Those things, those little tough. tests. They can to... be tough. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, come on. I mean, I mean, I honestly, like one time I got one of those Bloomberg emails and I accidentally clicked on something then I had to go Ooh. back through and do all of the training. Oh, so yeah. I'm super vigilant now and not You're doing busted. that. You're busted. You only make that mistake once. I know exactly. So never again after doing that. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. That's good fiber training. That was Dana Simberkoff, Chief Risk Privacy and Information Security Officer at AvPoint. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Up next, Apple just unveiling the iPhone 15 this week. But not before Chinese telecom giant Huawei released its own advanced mobile phone that uses tech the U.S. has sought to keep out of Beijing's hands. 
they have been able to make some sort of breakthroughs to tech levels that the U.S. was trying to avoid them to getting. And just to be clear, this isn't just so much that they don't want them necessarily to compete with uh, the iPhone uh, or, or Apple or other U.S. manufacturers or allies in terms of selling uh, phones. It's really a concern uh, about economic security as well as military security. The worry that some of these uh, chips and some of this technology that they could make breakthroughs on will be used in a way that can be quite competitive uh, militarily and security-wise with the U.S. We go from cybersecurity concerns at the corporate level to a technological arms race on a global scale. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. The excitement surrounding the iPhone 15's unveiling this past week was palpable for Apple loyalists around the world, except in one key market, China. Officials there are claiming to have experienced so-called security incidents with prior models. Bloomberg News reported this month that China plans to widen a ban on the use of iPhones to a number of state-backed companies and agencies. The White House says it's a retaliatory move against the U.S., And even before Apple's latest product launch, Huawei had already begun pre-sales of its new Mate 60 Pro phone, which uses technology the U.S. has sought to keep out of Beijing's hands. Jess Menton and I spoke with Bloomberg News senior editor Ramsey Alwarkabi and Business Week's Joel Weber for a read on the Chinese telecom giant's surprise development. All this news came from a Bloomberg teardown of a Huawei phone that revealed China had made significant advances on the chip front. And uh, it put some attention on uh, sanctions, which have been obviously a huge weapon that the U.S. has used not just to uh, perhaps try and slow China down, but also in Russia. And in Ramsey, the thing that came to mind was just that perhaps uh, the sanctions were an inevitable thing that would only work for a while, right? Yeah, the, the the timing of it was really noteworthy, too, because it came just on the end of a visit by the Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo. And her department, particularly the Bureau of Industry and Security, the ones that manage all of the uh, the tech controls, tech export controls that are put in place to try to keep this sort of technology out of China's hands. So the day that she's f- taking off, they quietly start selling this phone, which does send a clear message that they have been able to make some sort of breakthroughs to tech levels that the U.S. was trying to avoid them to getting. And just to be clear, this isn't just so much that they don't want them necessarily to compete with the, the iPhone uh, or, or Apple or other U.S. manufacturers or allies in terms of selling uh, phones. It's really a concern uh, about economic security as well as military security, the worry that some of these uh, chips and some of this technology that they could make breakthroughs on will be used in a way that can be quite competitive uh, militarily and security-wise with the U.S. Ramsey, I'm curious, how could this potentially escalate some of the tensions when we're thinking about what's already there right now between the U.S. and China? The thing is, that, I get back to Raimondo, she was on the tail end of a series of visits. There was Blinken had gone, Yellen had gone, John Kerry had gone. There was a there was an effort by the Biden administration to sort of uh, ease some of the tensions. Uh, and what happens, though, once this comes out, you're going to have a lot of pressure domestically to do more. You have the, uh, particularly in the House, the GOP, with like McCall and Gallagher calling for uh, stronger sanctions, stronger reactions, a stronger response from the administration to clamp down on some of the, the exports that are still allowed to some of these companies. So that kind of uh, can, can kind of heat up those tensions again on the commerce side of things that I think the, the White House is hoping could, could, uh, it could keep a, uh, keep a lid on. Okay, so what about uh, uh, the chips that came from like South Korea that ended up in the phone? What, what, is the, what does the U.S. feel about that? Well, I think the the SK Hynex memory chip uh, took SK Hynex by by surprise too. Uh, I don't. I think they don't know how Huawei got a hold of those. Uh, so that's a that's a question I we'll have to look into. And the, and the and the U.S. is you know investigating the where these chips came from on the China side, on the on the Korea side. And we had Jake Sullivan uh, quite recently saying that in, in a matter of time they're going to be looking into this and talk to their, their they said consult their partners. I'm assuming they mean South Koreans as well as the Dutch and the Japanese who. Who sort of who, who build some of the technology needed to make these chips, and uh, and then they'll said we'll make decisions accordingly. So I think uh, you know this took them by surprise. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're <laughs> they're trying to trying to figure out where you know what what what's out there, what's happening, and then they'll they also try to hopefully wait for this domestic political heat to cool off before they decide their next step. That was Bloomberg News senior editor Ramsey Alwarkabi with me and Jess Menton. 
Joel Weber will be sticking with us for our next couple of stories. And that wraps up the first hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week from Bloomberg Radio. Coming up in our next hour, we'll detail the remarkable true story of America's first women astronauts. Plus, the CEO of JCPenney talks renewal and reinvestment at the previously bankrupt retailer. And how MSG boss James Dolan turned his notepad sketch into a multi-billion dollar entertainment venue in the heart of Las Vegas. This is Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Tim Stenovec. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Tim Stenovec and Jess Menton with you. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including the CEO of JCPenney on bringing the embattled retailer back from near extinction and James Dolan's 10-figure bid to leave his mark on the future of entertainment. First up this hour, a bit of history. Back in 1977, more than 8,000 applied and six were chosen. The six, Sally Ride, Judy Resnick, Anna Fisher, Kathy Sullivan, Shannon Lucid, and Rhea Seddon, were America's first women astronauts. And they're the subject of a new book from Bloomberg News space reporter Lauren Grush. It's called The Six, The Untold Story of America's First Women Astronauts. An excerpt of the book was published in the August 28th issue of the magazine. And this past week, Jess and I welcomed Business Week editor Joel Weber and Lauren into our New York studios to discuss the project, along with the author's unique background. So I'm actually a bit of a NASA baby. Um, both of my parents worked on the space shuttle program, which is, you know, makes a big appearance in the book. Um, my mother was the deputy orbiter chief engineer, and then my father helmed up the propulsion branch before he retired. And so I very much, you know, the, I grew up with the space shuttle. Um, I lived outside of Houston. It really was like a full circle moment getting to report on it and, and go back to kind of my childhood roots. The part that we wanted to talk about in the book was specifically about Sally Ride. And when you worked on that part of the book, like, I'm curious, like, there's an element that still resonates today. And I'm curious, like, walk us through why Sally Ride matters all these years later. Absolutely. I think right now it's more relevant than ever. You know, NASA is working to go back to the moon with its Artemis program. And one of the stated goals of that program is to send the first woman and the first person of color to the lunar surface. And I really think that is a first for NASA to actually have that a stated goal. You know, normally in their programs, they really don't specify who would go. It's really just we're going to get there and we'll send the right people for the job when we do. So I, this is a bit of a first. And so it's interesting that they're clarifying that before they go and I think Sally's story is really pertinent right now because obviously when Sally was going up to space you know it was such a novel concept for the country even though you know it really shouldn't have been you know a lot of journalists and the media were asking questions with about her and you know we're just so curious how that women and men could possibly fly into space together so you know, Sally kind of took on that burden when she was the first one. And so hopefully, you know, as we move forward and try to fix these, you know, errors in our space history by sending the first woman and the first person of color to the moon, those people have it a little bit easier. Uh, and the press will, you know, I'll be a member of the press, so I won't ask those questions <laughs> of those people when they fly. <laughs> Let's talk about the American competition, right? Mm -hmm. And that was like a fascinating competition because it was like, it, it, a moment of equality and yet like was it well i mean you have to understand uh when you have a group of competitive astronauts as you had with the the class of astronauts that sally was in uh you know they're an extremely competitive group of individuals so obviously their sole ambition was to fly into space i hear that is the sole ambition of every astronaut obviously and so uh you know obvious they all wanted to be the first and i think with the women, obviously, there was that added pressure of being the first American woman. And so the issue they had, though, was they really had no idea what the terms of this quote unquote competition were. Obviously, NASA wasn't saying there was a competition, but everybody was asking about it. The media all knew about it. They were all kind of picking their favorites by who they liked to cover and who, you know, they, they thought maybe fit the best uh, feminine archetype, you know, uh, that that was kind of playing out in the press before they were chosen. We'll talk a little bit more about the press coverage at the time. And mm -hmm. um, I keep having to remind myself, this isn't that long ago. No. I mean, we're talking like just before the 1980s, which, you know, 
was the decade I was born in. Like, this is not that long ago. Yeah, I mean, even when they first came on board, when the first six women came on board, you know, a reporter asked during the initial press conference that announced them, you know, was Shannon's three kids taken into account? And it's, you know, we've been flying with men who had children for many, many years by that point, and still, you know, they were concerned about whether or not a mother could handle this role. And so that was just reflected in many of the questions that were asked. Sally probably got the worst of them just because she was the first, you know, Famously, she was asked if um, she wept in the simulator when it broke down. Uh, there were some other, I mean, there is another one. I, I actually have the video of that press conference before she flew, which you have to watch in person because she, her facial expressions are just so good. Um, she handled it very gracefully, but you can tell, you know, she's hurting inside. And um, there was another question that was asking her, you know, you know, you quit tennis. She used to be a tennis player before she came to the space program, and it was, you, you quit tennis because you didn't think you had the ability to go pro, would you have quit the space program if you hadn't been the first American woman picked? So, you know, just kind of terrible questions like that. You know, they asked uh, if she'd be the first mom in space. One uh, anchor asked if she wished she were a man, you know, it just truly you wonder how, I, I, I keep saying during these interviews, you know, I apologize for our press ancestors because feel yeah. like we, we've come a long way since I'm with, I'm with you. <laughs> These six women had a pretty diverse professional background. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. Yeah, that's what I love most about the cohort is they are so illustrative of how there's just no one true path to space. You know, we had two medical doctors, an astrophysicist and tennis player, an electric, electrical engineer, an oceanographer, and geologist, and a chemist. And um, not only were they diverse in the types of fields that they worked in, but also in terms of whether or not they always wanted to be astronauts. You know, some of, half of them had dreamed about it their whole lives or had secretly harbored this ambition, while the other half didn't even think about it until they saw that NASA was opening up the selection process. And I just think that's a really great uh, illustration of, you know, when you when you make things more diverse and accessible for people, those who uh, would be great in those roles would realize that they could actually do it um, when they wouldn't have before. Okay, there's also this subtle thing that comes up in the book that um, astronauts seem to have a chemical attraction to one another. <laughs> How many different relationships were there? Were yeah. We, there, was there were three, three of the women did marry other astronauts and, and some one they married, you know, before they became astronauts, but are, secretly harbored that ambition. Others met through the program. And um, I think that's just in, it's indicative of the fact that they spent a lot of time together. You know, this was a very close, tight knit group of astronauts, the TFNGs. Um, you know, the men, I actually say this in the book, you know, what was described to me is the women weren't exactly, you know, the bestest of friends, you know, which you might think they were being, you know, very similar in how, you know, how they were picked and the things that were asked of them. But it was really the men that they spent most of their time with. For instance, they had to stay current in NASA's uh, fleet of T-38 jets. And so, um, since the women weren't able to fly the planes themselves, they had to be in the back seat, and so they spent a lot of time with male pilots, and so they would start to gravitate towards the pilots that they liked the most. So I think it just goes to show that when you put a lot of, um, you know, very accomplished, good-looking people together and you make <laughs> them spend a lot of time together, you know, romance is bloom. <laughs> um, how are things at NASA today in terms of gender breakdown? Because if you look at the airline industry, mm -hmm. it's still relatively rare to actually have a female captain. Yeah, I mean, there's still quite a long way to go. While each of the astronaut selections since the six were chosen have had women, you know, they all haven't been equal. And in terms of the women who've gone to space, I think we're still below one sixth of the people who've gone to space have actually been women. And the women of the, the statistics for women of color are just even more abysmal. We have such a long way to go to, to really reach that equality. So, Why is that? You know, I just think that um, we when you put up societal barriers in place, it takes quite a, f a long time to break them down. So, you know, think of the criteria that 
it takes to become an astronaut. We had to really like encourage women and people of color to go in STEM fields because they were discouraged from going into those fields for so long. And it just takes a while to, you know, break those barriers down. So, and it, when it comes to space, things take a really long time. Developmental time takes, you know, it's, we're talking on the order of years and decades, but to that point, it's probably you know, safe to say that we could be doing more, you know, there's better ways to, you know, encourage a more diverse set of people to get into the program. So it's just something to keep top of mind. Our thanks to Bloomberg News space reporter Lauren Grush. Her new book is just out. It's called The Six, The Untold Story of America's First Women Astronauts. You can catch the full conversation on the Business Week podcast feed. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, while billionaire James Dolan has compiled a massive sports and entertainment portfolio that includes two New York sports teams and a variety of arenas and theaters, his latest project could redefine his legacy. You know, some people call Madison Square Garden, you know, the most famous venue in the world, yet he has this idea he wants to disrupt live entertainment. Our Business Week team takes you inside the sphere in the heart of Sin City. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. For the last several years, people visiting Las Vegas might have been puzzled as they gazed westward from the Strip. Looming in the distance was a 366-foot-tall sphere. The dark orb bore a familial resemblance to the Death Star, but lacked any signage offering a clue to its purpose. Devin Leonard is out with a new feature that delves into the convoluted history and promise of what's known as the Sphere. It's in the latest issue of Bloomberg Businessweek magazine, available now on newsstands online and on the terminal. Devin and Joel Weber are with me and Jess Menton to detail the one-of-a-kind venue and the man behind the project, New York Knicks and Rangers owner and CEO of MSG Entertainment, James Dolan. He's actually kind of fascinating in that he has other interests. Music's a big one. And he saw this opportunity to basically build something in Vegas that had never been built before. And he had a vision that I think originated more or less with him. And he went and like did it. And now it's like going to open and there has never been a music venue like this. So yeah, it's really easy to hate on James Dolan. And the guy may have pulled off like what's basically the perhaps a world-class music venue unlike any other. And it's shaped like a sphere, and that's what it's called, right, Devin? The sphere. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, you know, this, this is a guy. He embarks on this thing. You know, he's he's past sixty. He's got you know all the money he needs. He's the son of you know son of a billionaire, Charles Dolan, a cable you know cable TV pioneer. His family controls you know some of the world's most you know famous venues. You know, some people call it Madison Square Garden. You, you know, you know the most famous venue in the world. And yet he has this idea. He wants to disrupt live entertainment by building, you know, what's basically, it, what is, it's, you know, it's, it's a round, it's an orb-like, you know, sphere. And it's it's sort of three different things. You know, at night, it's going to be a concert hall with this sort of state-of-the-art sound system and also this huge LED screen that's as big as, or bigger than, I should say, three football fields. And, uh, you know, the high, they're calling it the highest uh, resolution LED screen in the world. In the daytime, it's going to be sort of more of a tourist attraction, immersive entertainment. You've got to see pictures and videos of this thing to actually do it justice. Yeah. I mean, you... Hearing about it is one thing. Totally. But this thing is actually really, really cool. No, that, I mean, that that's something that really kind of blew my mind was that uh, when I went out to Vegas to go take a tour, I actually, I, I stayed in the Westin, you know, which is sort of overlooking it. And I asked them, you know, hey, can I, can I, I want to look out at the sphere because it, like, <laughs> it was 114 degrees. I got to do it for work. Right? Yeah. No, I, I'm not going to go outside. But, it, but no, but, but I, got, I got in there and just looked at it uh, out the window. I, I, no, I couldn't believe it. I mean, that, that, that's when, you know, again, as I say in the story, a lot of people, you know, were doubting. A lot of people were saying this, you know, this is never going to work. This is the Death Star. And then they turned it on and, you know, everybody had, you know, people just kind of went nuts. So why a sphere? What was the inspiration behind it? You know, that's a really good question. He, he, he or, you know, in 2016, you know, but they, his family just sold Cablevision. They just, they just sold it for $18 billion. You know, and I, I make a joke in the story. The guy plays in the band. I mean, he could have just gone off and played, played in the band. And so he's like, <laughs> he drew a picture, you, you know, on a, on a notepad and, you know, and, and told this guy, been the chief technology officer of a Cablevision, this is the venue of the future. Let's go out and disrupt the live entertainment business. I, I don't actually know where know where he got he got that idea, but but it turns out that from an engineering standpoint, it is oh, right. an incredibly difficult. No, it's insane. To, to exactly. attempt to play music in. How, so how did they go about solving that 
Well, that it's, an, challenge. It, it, it's an acoustical nightmare because everything just echoes in the, in the, in, inside a sphere. So they, they, they found a company in called Holoplot in Germany that, that basically beams audio to using algorithms to to different places, you know, to where, wherever you're sitting, the, the algorithm's set up. So they're basically measuring, they're creating these beams, you know, of sound and, and, and they're measured. So everybody sort of hears the same thing. But that way, since you're sending the audio right to the people, you're everything isn't just bouncing all around and, and, and echoing. And that's just one of the sort of crazy, crazy, and, and, I, and I think ultimately expensive things they did and, and uh, helps explain why this thing went from $1.2 billion, you know, price tag to uh, $2.3 billion. And inflation, yeah, that's the right, thing. Right. Um, Who's counting? <laughs> um, so, so wait, there's going to be a big act that's going to open this up and because this is going to happen. And I mean, it's already in Vegas. It's built. They're yeah. already doing weird stuff on the strip. Right. Who's opening? Uh, a little band from Ireland called uh, U2. Oh, I've mean, heard of them. If, yeah. I think if Tim Cook will make, be there. Yeah, if you're going to make <laughs> if you're going to make a splash like launch with with uh, with U2, how, how long are they going to be opening there? Too? They're, they're going to be playing for 25, 25 nights. And, and tickets are how much? You know, I, I think they started around $150. Oh, yeah, but, I, I mean, I'm going. <laughs> well, I mean, they're almost all sold out. So I think if yeah. you want to go, Joel, you're yeah. going to have to look on StubHub and you yeah. know, th th those prices are yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, it's a good point, though, Joel, that you bring up. If it's good enough for Bono, uh, right. then, you know, it's good enough for other musicians. right? I, just, I also just think this is this is the future, right? Like live event. We know that live events are where artists make their money. If well, you can make a, a an artist a venue unlike any other, what happens? You can get yeah. anybody you want. Well, and they don't have to travel. So, so I, I mean, these these bands have like these caravans of trucks that uh, you, you know they carry their, their 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 you know all the equipment around. All the, they take their LED lighting around. They take their sound systems around all these concert halls. And and and, and in this case, as from what I'm told with you two and other bands, they actually have two sets. You know, two caravans. That you, you know, that, you know that that uh, move in between in between venues. So so when they're so the one the next one's you know they're setting up the next venue while you know while they're breaking down the first. Anyway, I mean it, it it sounds it's enormously expensive and it's a huge headache. And you know, and I guess if they can spend you know a couple of months in Vegas, you know some people are definitely going to want to do that. And some of the bands, by the way, that they're talking about are Coldplay and uh, Fish. Um, Harry Styles is. They, they, I know, can't wait for up. the yeah, fish anyway, heads so, to. Yeah. I mean, the fish place. heads descend on MSG all yeah. the time. Uh, so well, Dolan's yeah. got this relationship no, true. with exactly. fish. That's yeah, right. they know That's what they're right. doing. Yeah, you pack that house. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so there's also a possibility that Vegas won't be the only place that has a sphere. Uh, not if Jim Dolan can help it. Yeah. No, they're they're they're. they're they're trying to get permission to build one in, in London, and, you know, and they're they're scouting a, a other locations. But after spending uh, two point three billion dollars, they want to change their plans and get partners because he's not going to want to do that again. Yeah. He, well, he's already said he says he's not going to do that again. Right. Right. Okay, so Joel, you mentioned that you know with live music in this day and age, the the world of Beyonce, the world of Taylor Swift, people will pay for certain acts and, and certain experiences. More than one hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, for sure. Well More over. Than yeah, <laughs> you didn't see me going to Beyonce or Taylor Swift <laughs> concerts, even though I wanted to. Uh, Devin, <laughs> it was hard to see this coming, like the post-pandemic surge and especially the high prices that people would pay. Talk about the construction of this and the way that the pandemic derailed it, because this thing was in the works before uh, the summer of twenty twenty-three. No, because that's I mean that that's the whole thing. They they basically they leased eighteen acres of land from from. Uh, Las Vegas Sands, and uh, they started to build this thing, and um, and then in in 2020 the pandemic hits, and it just drives up the cost of you know steel, uh, computer chips, you know basically you know just saying the story, just about anything you need to, you know for for a multi billion dollar development. LEDs were more expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need yeah, a few yeah, of yeah. those. Yeah, no, no, yes, especially for the inside and the outside of the exosphere. But uh, so 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 that effect, and, and also it halted construction. They were initially going to open in 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 2021, so that set them back three years. But but uh, but it was also just all this advanced technology, all these things they were experimenting with. They had to create an entirely new camera just to be able to capture images. 
large enough to fit you know that screen they, they were stitching images together from multiple cameras a before. camera that, yeah. and they had to patent this thing because it's like the quality and size of this image is so big i well, mean they, like I think, this is like there's like some feats of, of engineering they, that went they, into they patented making a lot of thing. stuff yeah. I, I mean i i came i, I there's i think the numbers are like 60 patents overall and not so, just I mean, the, the camera is just you know like eight or something so our thanks to senior global business writer for the magazine devin leonard and once again the editor of bloomberg business week joel weber Still to come on Bloomberg Business Week, we turn our attention to the retail sector and the resurrection of JCPenney. CEO Mark Rosen stops by to explain the strategy and why it's paying off. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Tim Stenevec, along with Bloomberg News Deputy Team Leader for U.S. Equities, Jess Menton, who's in for Carol Master this week. Our next guest is a veteran of Walmart and Levi Strauss, who's facing perhaps his toughest challenge yet, reviving the storied brand of JCPenney, which dates back more than 120 years. The department store chain filed for bankruptcy shortly after the start of the pandemic in 2020. Then, in November of 2021, a new leader took the helm. Just last month, the company announced a $1 billion reinvestment plan that focuses on digital and in-store experiences. This past week, we caught up with Mark Rosen, the CEO of the now privately held JCPenney. He joined us from the company's headquarters in Plano, Texas. We are a private company, but what I can share is we now have sales that are over um, $8 billion. We have just over 650 stores across the country. And um, we also operate jcp.com. So we're serving customers everywhere right now. And um, the business is uh, really, you, you, you mentioned that we emerged from bankruptcy and we emerged with a very, very clean balance sheet in a strong, strong financial position with less than a half a billion dollars of, uh, with less than $500 million of um, debt on the balance sheet. So really financially positioned to drive forward and really reinvigorate this brand and reestablish our relationship and our relevance with our consumers, which is really the core of America. You might have heard Romaine just a little earlier uh, talking about over the weekend visiting a mall, seeing a JCPenney that was no longer operating and even having the conversation with his family about whether or not the store still exists. How do you change that narrative and, and let people know that, yes, JCPenney is here and uh, we've got 650 stores across the country. How do you do it? Well, that's actually part of, so you mentioned that we just announced a, a, an over a billion dollar investment back into the business. And that, that investment is focused on um, remodeling our stores and um, reinvesting in the store platform, putting new technology and new point of sale in, in re, um, revitalizing our online shopping experience and really improving the jcp.com shopping experience and then also our supply chain. But I would say we're a retailer, and so it all really starts out with product. And over the last couple of years, what we've done is re, um, reintroduce over 25 of our brands, brands like Stafford that every customer knows and loves and a lot of customers grew up with, brands like Liz Claiborne, um, and brands like Cooks in our in our homes in our home area, and so we've reintroduced that product. And now, what we're investing in, also along with that, a billion dollars, is a what we're calling a brand reinvigoration that is centered around really helping our customers make it count. And when we look at our customer, I said our customers the core of America. It's the the school teachers that teach our children. It's the construction workers that build our homes and the uh, the buildings we work in. It's medical workers who take care of our families. And that customer is looking for um, a sense of belonging. They're looking for a place where they can find accessible fashion that they can still get at a great value because that customer is making trade-offs every day in their life. And so what we're introducing also is a, is a campaign to reinvigorate the brand centering around how we help our customers make every moment in their lives, whether it's a big moment like their daughter's wedding or whether it's a smaller moment like getting their kids ready for school in the morning, but how do they um, use the products that we have at JCPenney to make that count, but be able to make it count, but still have money left to put breakfast on the table for the kids. Hey, Mark, whenever you're talking about middle income shoppers, and especially with this inflation dynamic, how do you sort of view that as far as how to get shoppers back in when they are trying to figure out where to sort of shift their spending at this point? Right. Inflation is an issue for our customer. We look right now, we see that our customer is spending 
um, over $700 a month more just for rent or mortgage, for groceries, for gas. And that means that every dollar is even more important to them. And it's more important that they make every dollar count. And that's really what we're here for is to help them do that. And I think the unique thing that we can bring to the table is we can bring great fra great fashion and great product at a really accessible price to our customers. And that's what they're that's what they need. That's what they're looking for right now in their lives. When you talk about technology upgrades to some of these stores, kind of build on that. What more specifically are you doing? Uh, within the stores, it's a lot of it's it's mobile and it's point of sale or checkout technology. So we'll be um, within the stores centralizing the checkout, but we'll also be putting in the hand of hands of all of our associates in the stores mobile devices that will help them manage inventory better. It'll help them ship and fulfill online orders. It'll help them check inventory and order online for a customer. Or I talked about centralized checkout. What it really will do is move checkout anywhere so that they can mobile check out a customer anywhere in the store. Sales of over $8 billion. Where do more sales happen right now at the 650 stores across the country or jcpenny.com? So it's about a 70-30 split with stores the 70% and with the online business about 30. And where are you more bullish? So both are actually growing um, and, and, and we're focused on growing both. But I do believe that right now, We've um, done a significant amount of reimagining our online experience and and investing in JCP.com, and we think there's significant growth there. So, do you think that it'll is it growing at a faster rate, and like you'll eclipse store sales with JCP.com in a number of years? The JCP.com business is growing faster than the store business. I. I don't believe that it's ever going to eclipse. I think you could reach like, you know, a 40, 60 point or wow. something like that. But the reality is what we're seeing is that customers still want to shop in stores. They still want to come in. They want to have that try and experience. They want to get help from an associate to put together an outfit. And in important areas like we reintroduced beauty, a customer's looking to come in and get help and try product. When you look at this portfolio, whether it's fashion, apparel, home, beauty, as well as jewelry, where are you seeing spending the strongest and where do you see people pulling back the most? It's interesting because if we look across the business, we're really pleased with the growth that we've seen in our home business and in our men's and women's apparel business. And we believe we've, bring, we've gained share in all of those areas because customers are spending there. Our jewelry business is another one that continues to be really strong right now. I think rather than seeing people um, reduce spending in particular areas. We're actually seeing that within an area, they're being a little bit more um, selective about what they're choosing. And we are seeing some more growth come from some of our private label brands. For example, in, a, in home, we're seeing products like Cooks, which is a private label opening price point, um, small a small appliance, think like blenders and toasters and things like that, and cookware. We're seeing customers choose that product in some cases right. because they realize it's great value and they can save money by, by going for that product. So no, are you going to stay a private company forever or is there an IPO on the horizon? So right now we're really actually focused on just driving sustainable, profitable customer growth within the business. And we're very fortunate that we have an ownership group that is aligned with doing that and focused on the long term. And right now, um, you know, the focus is, is, is building that relationship with customers, driving customers back to the brand. And then we'll see where it goes from there. That was Mark Rosen, CEO of JCPenney. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, we stick with the retail theme and examine how AI is increasingly becoming part of the shopping experience. That's what Lily AI does. We are using AI to bridge the gap between retailers speak and consumers speak in retail. And this is the perfect type of um, of problem that AI can come in and help solve to understand the language of the consumer uh, use AI to extract those attributes out of the images of the product catalog mm -hmm. and then um, help the consumer experiences. The CEO of Lily AI breaks down her company's unique data-driven tools designed to help streamline product discovery in the world of e-commerce. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Tim Stenevec with Bloomberg's Jess Matten, who's in for Carol. And Jess, we've got yet another use for everybody's favorite type of tech. So the hype in artificial intelligence, as we know, is everywhere. But what about when it comes to the intersection of AI and retailers? 
Well, there is a company that is powered by AI that is aiming to bridge that gap and make selling easier for companies, especially when you're talking about Bloomingdale's, Macy's, The Gap, uh, back to school purchases, obviously starting up right now, and then also ahead of the holiday shopping season. Joining us now is Purva Gupta, co-founder and chief executive officer at Lily AI, joining us on Zoom from Palo Alto, California. Thank you so much for joining us. Talk to us about what your company is and what you do just to set the scene here. My company is is called Lily AI. We are working with some of the largest brands and retailers. But let me ask you a question. I'm sure you shop online um, all I the do. time. And have you gone through an experience when you're looking for something as simple as a navy blue sweatshirt and you are getting no results or you're getting even worse, red lipsticks and slippers? <laughs> um, it's not that they don't have navy blue sweatshirts, but the reason why that's happening is because the 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 way that the products are described at retailers are in the language of midnight French terry at leisure. Like that's why you're not finding it because it's not called navy blue sweatshirt. It's not labeled in the language that us as consumers use. And so that's what Lily AI does. We are using AI to bridge the gap between retailer speak and consumer speak in retail. And this is the perfect type of, of problem that AI can come in and help solve to understand the language of the consumer, use AI to extract those attributes out of the images of the product catalog, mm -hmm. and then help the consumer experiences. Okay, so you got to explain to me, like I'm a five-year-old, how AI is being used here and how it's training itself, it's retraining itself. Take us through the basics. AI is being used for um, years now. It literally started in 1950s. And fundamentally, AI is when machines are mimicking human intelligence, right? And recently, generative AI is all the hype. Everybody's heard of ChatGPT. Um, that's one type of AI. There are so many other types of AI, like computer vision, natural language processing, all of those types of things. And so now coming back to your question around um, how we use AI, we have basically built, uh, we use a type of AI called discriminative AI, where we have created a lot of clean training data where merchants on our team over the last few years have manually labeled all of the products and added a lot of the language of the consumer on every single product. How long then does that take to of, do that kind of process? Seems very painful. Uh, <laughs> it's a very, very difficult process where you almost have to create the definitions in fashion in a very, very clean mathematical way where our merchants know the difference between boho and boho chic, for example, mm. right? It needs to be really, really clean data for AI to understand all of the different types of language that our consumers use or just overall consumers use. And and so it's 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 not an easy thing. It's a very, very difficult laborsome process that we have gone through to be able to create all this clean training data, which we then fed to our AI engines, which now do it, which are now doing a really good job of predicting um, all of these attributes um, on these products, which is basically the images. So in short, we have built the technology that can extract attributes in the language that consumers understand out of images. That was Purva Gupta, co-founder and CEO at Lily AI. And that wraps up the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week from Bloomberg Radio. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to tune into Bloomberg Business Week Monday through Friday starting at 3 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg Radio and on Sirius XM Channel 119. You can also watch our daily broadcast on YouTube. Just search Bloomberg Global News. And we're simulcast on Bloomberg Originals, available at Bloomberg.com slash originals and streaming platforms like Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Samsung TV Plus, and more. Find our Bloomberg Business Week podcast at Bloomberg.com, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. The latest edition of the magazine is available on newsstands now at Bloomberg.com and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Have a good and safe weekend, everyone. For Jess Menton and Simone Foxman, I'm Tim Stenovec. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.